Welcome to another Achieve CE live webinar. This course is approved by the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education, otherwise known as ACPE. Once you complete this webinar, your course credits will be reported to the CPE monitor and CE broker within 24 to 48 hours, and you will be emailed a certificate. The last few minutes of this webinar will be dedicated to a live question and answer session with the instructor. Please feel free to enter your questions or comments in the chat below during the presentation, and they will be responded to by the instructor at the end. At the end of this webinar, a link to a short online survey will be provided in the chat. Please note that you must complete this survey in order to receive course credit. In case you're new here at Achieve CE, we focus on offering courses on the important trending topics of the day to keep you up to date in your field, while also satisfying your continuing education requirements. Aside from our live webinars, we also offer on-demand text and video courses to take at your convenience, all which are available in our membership. We're excited you're here today and hope you enjoy the webinar. With no further ado, I'll go ahead and pass it over to today's instructor. Welcome everyone to our presentation titled the 2023 American Geriatric Society Beers List Update, Key Changes for Medication Safety. Here today, you're hearing from yours truly, Mark Payne Guy Garofoli. Uh, so the quick rundown on uh, your speaker's history here. Uh, I'm, of course, a Pitt PharmD grad, uh, Schreyer MBA grad, uh, BCGP, CPE, and CTTS, as you can read here. Uh, I've worked in various different uh, fields uh, and genres here within our profession of pharmacy, uh, including with CVS Health, Humana Healthcare, uh, the West Virginia Safe and Effective Management of Pain Program and Guidelines. Uh, and today, I'm actually a faculty uh, with the West Virginia University or WVU School of Pharmacy uh, for as being a director of experiential learning and a, a faculty member therein. Uh, also a faculty member within our WVU School of Medicine Pain Fellowship Program uh, and also being a pain and addiction pharmacist. I've uh, done a 2021 TEDx talk. Uh, I've done various grant reviews, including the CDC, expert witness work, both civil and criminal, uh, seasoned CE developer, here we are, right? Uh, and of course, host of the Pain Pod on the Pharmacy Podcast Network. And I run my trademarked uh, na name of Pain Guy, the Pain Guy website being www.painguy.us. So enough about your presenter. Onward to our disclosures. One more slide I do have to read with the next one too, of course. Uh, this activity was developed by Achieve CE free of any commercial support. Um, I uh, have no relevant financial relationships with ineligible companies to disclose. Uh, Pete Kreckel and uh, pharmacists and planners for this educational event also have no relevant financial relationships with ineligible companies to disclose. As far as our learning objectives for this uh, talk here on the beers list or beers criteria. Uh, so first, we want to recall common anatomical and physiological aging changes that can affect the safety and efficacy of medications. And second, we want to identify potentially inappropriate medications or PIMS for utilization in older adults based on the recent AGS beers list update. And finally, three, to recognize potentially inappropriate drug interactions for older adults based on the recent AGS beers list update. Ah, uh, so where to begin? Well, perhaps some reflection here first. You know, uh, big picture. Hey, we're all aging, right? We either already are or want to be in the elderly population, right? Uh, that being, of course, those 65 years of age and older. Uh, and that population percentage is certainly growing. It has been for some time now and is forecasted, as you hopefully can see here, uh, to continue growing throughout the next couple decades. Uh, one of the big terms, of course, is a, a centurion. Here we see a Roman soldier centurion, but not that one, okay? That, that's back in the day. We're, some of us maybe want to be centurions. That's those living to 100 years of age, well past the threshold of 65 years of age for elderly. Now, in thinking about, uh, hey, we all uh, want to age, right, to enjoy life to its fullest, uh, we got to remember that, well, everybody's different. There's certainly uh, differences amongst us with patient variability on many ways in a pharmacological sense, whether pharmacodynamic, pharmacokinetic, 
uh, and we'll go over some different anatomy and physiology changes in a moment here, but uh, there's also just even on the surface generational differences. Now, uh, the, these are, you know, uh, kind of like a guide along the way. Uh, first and foremost, when we go over the birth years, they're approximate. Uh, you know, different references will have a year or two or three different here or there, but, you know, it's the general idea of it, of course. Uh, and then there's those of us that are kind of right on the, you know, the borderline between two generations per se. So maybe we take all of or some of the uh, qualities uh, or aspects of each generation. Uh, but uh, really important to keep this in mind, uh, you know, not necessarily with the PKPD, the pharmacology side of things, but in working with our, our elderly population for our patients, you know, those uh, 65 and older. Uh, but just, you know, overall generational differences, we have the, you know, the, the big picture generations here, uh, starting out back with uh, the GI or silent generation from 1900 to 1945. Um, there with personalities, respect, loyalty, and order. As far as preferred coaching, no news is good news. Let's let us fly, right? Uh, typically conservative, uh, uh, like to work but don't live to work. Uh, and a key reward would be satisfaction of a job well done. Sounds good, right? Uh, then, of course, we have the baby boomer generation. Uh, big time when it comes to um, you know the, the care that we're talking about today for patients. Uh, birth years from 1946 to 1964, give or take. Uh, as far as personalities, we got optimism uh, and certainly rejecting authority. Uh, preferred coaching once a year, needed or not, but always there. You know the annual review, right? As far as descriptions, uh, typically uh, observed to be grow up in nuclear families, uh, unlike their own. Uh, usually team players and workaholics. You know uh, the idea of you know putting in the 80-hour work week when maybe 40 hours could pull off the same, or you know at least a little bit less. Uh, do not want to be continually connected, getting away, right? Uh, key rewards are money, title, and recognition. Pretty straightforward, right? All right, then we've got Generation X. That's from 1965 to 1980, give or take. Uh, personalities, skeptical, do not value loyalty. Uh, certainly going to reject micromanaging uh, and will have known to be asking, hey, how am I doing? Uh, you know, converse to the idea of an annual review, just every now and then saying, hey, how am I doing? Uh, typically, observationally, grew up in a single parent or dual earner families. Uh, independent and always question the establishment. Key reward for X, freedom and time. It's almost like we're talking about the, the five love languages or, or the five languages within a workplace even, uh, time being one of those. Then we have Gen Y or the Millennials. Uh, approximately from 1981 to 1995 for birth years. Uh, certainly going to res be respectful, confident, uh, prefer coaching that's engaging with immediate feedback. Oftentimes even wanting things labeled as, hey, I'm providing feedback. Uh, as far as descriptions, got uh, trophy kids with helicopter parents. Uh, typically do not respect the chain of commands. Uh, key reward being meaningful work. All right, then we've got Generation Z. Approximately from 1996 to 2011, empowering. We want coaching that is collaborative. Uh, keeping in mind, these folks are raised on the internet, very comfortable with social media, even particular ones. Uh, this generation, um, you know, uh, certainly getting into the realm of college graduation, workforce already. Uh, and then we have Generation Alpha, a very approximately from 2012 to the present. Very inspiring. Uh, as far as coaching, it's co-creation. Uh, but again, we, we you know, have uh, adolescents here, not necessarily uh, those well into their career. Uh, but uh, these, this generation was the first born entirely in this 21st century. Uh, adult total will be in the 2030s uh, when the population uh, will be about 9 billion across the old globe, right? Uh, so these are things to keep in mind overall, of course. Uh, we cannot define a person by what generation they're in. But it's at least a, a you know a, a gravel road to go down. It's not paved, uh, but we got to keep in mind the individuality along the way. But just the big picture too, uh, you know the proverbial rule. Even with me with a mic right now, you got to know your audience, right? Even if it's on the one-on-one. -on -one. So hopefully this review of generational differences uh, will be helpful for us in patient care and things to keep in mind as we go over the intricate information uh, for this beers list update. All right, now that we went over the big picture for generational uh, differences, 
let's get down to our human bodies, right? Again, that overall idea that we're all different. We're humans. We're not snowflakes, but we're humans, okay? Uh, but as we age, we, be, we change along the way, obviously, right? Uh, so here we're going to review some aging anatomy and physiology. Uh, we'll go through basically some, some of the heavy hitter uh, human body systems along the way. Okay. Uh, so first up, let's all have a heart, right? Now let's go over the cardiovascular system changes as we age, as all of us age. Uh, our heart wall will thicken because the muscle is used more and more throughout life, so the muscle grows, right? Uh, our heart rate will typically decrease along with our systolic blood pressure increasing. Jumping over to the lungs, not that far from the heart, right? Uh, our chest wall will thicken and central airways will widen. And all that's going to pretty much result in a decreased pulmonary flow. Now, very importantly, jumping into the central nervous system or CNS, uh, our brain size is going to decrease. Darn it. Um, well, you know, it's not about the size always. It's how those neurons are firing too. But brain size will decrease. And importantly, for medications or any substances, uh, the BBB, not the Better, Beers, Better Business Bureau, but the blood-brain barrier, uh, will decrease as well. Certainly going to come into play for our uh, more lipophilic uh, medications that are out there. All right, again, jumping into the uh, renal world, I guess, or renal realm, uh, our kidney size, of course, will decrease. Everything's always decreasing, right, uh, as far as size. Uh, GFR, uh, glomerular fatulation rate, is also going to decrease as well. Obviously, that's going to come into play for the excretion of medications. Uh, within the hepatic system, of course, liver mass is going to decrease, like all the other organs, right? Uh, but also CYP450, you know, the phase one um, uh, metabolism of medications and all substances, that effort is typically going to decrease as well. Again, big time coming into the metabolism of medications here. So we see the, you know, we're, as our body ages, all the ADME, the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, all these things are getting affected along the way. All right, now uh, for the immune system, we could pretty much just say across the board, the immune system function is going to decrease. Yes, that means individually for all the different cytokines and T cells, B cells, you know, tanks, bombs, here or there, everything, the overall idea is just decreased in, in the realm there. So, you know, conversations on vaccinations, immunizations, all that kind of stuff comes up into play as well, too. All right, jumping into our, our tummies and beyond, the GI tract. Uh, ga these are basically opposites here, but gastric emptying frequency decreases. Gastric emptying time duration increases. So things are in, uh, you know, the gastric area longer. Uh, then big picture here, just thinking big picture as far as our overall bodies, a uh, couple pointers here that are really important. Uh, the body water to muscle ratio is going to decrease. Okay. Uh, and body fat increases. Ah, darn it, right? Well, perhaps, you know, throughout the centuries, that's meant to keep us a little bit warmer as our bodies are decreasing in size. Uh, but we got to keep that in mind, not just for uh, well beyond aesthetics and all that kind of stuff, uh, really looking into the lipophilicity of medications. So when we're reviewing the beers list updates, we want to keep that in mind along with all of these ideas this uh you know along with generational differences and just how everything in the body and our you know the overall approach to us uh, is changing over time uh, that's really going to come into play for how we go about patient care for those 65 and older well and keeping all of those things in mind the generational differences the our human body changes Let's segue into a little bit more pharmacology, right? Uh, so here's a reference uh, in general, just uh, talking to the idea of uh, some polypharmacy going on here uh, as, uh, it, you know, as we're aging. Uh, it's perfectly natural to be thinking, well, is it more likely uh, to have more medications as one ages? Well, if you look across the population, of course so, but not everyone, right? Uh, but as far as uh, the elderly population, again, 65 and older, uh, unique medications of one, well, that's that's at least 90% of folks have at least one. Uh, at least 40% of folks have at least five. And more than one in 10 will have at least 10 unique medications. And I'm sure in your observations, you might even see more staggering numbers, right? But we need to be able to wrap our heads around that of how we help our geriatric population. 
All right, so how do we go about, you know, providing exceptional, you know, top of our license uh, care for our elderly population, uh, those patients 65 and older? Uh, so we have some tools within our tool belt, and it's uh, it's not all about the beers list, okay? Uh, you know, first and foremost, of course, we have the American Geriatric Society, or AGS, beers criteria or beers list uh, updates, you know, typically every three or four years, give or take. Uh, we'll go over that in a moment, but um, that's one of the tools. It is the tool that we're going to review the most here today, of course. Uh, and a lot of times when we, we are reviewing it, there's going to be a reference material provided for your further review. Uh, but we'll talk about, you know, the surface and a little bit subsurface to go, you know, how we could uh, help along the way here. You know, these conversations could be hours long, and particularly if you go even beyond the beers list update, uh, you're, you're going to be uh, around for almost a day, if not multiple days, right? Uh, so we're going to concentrate on the beers list updates here today. But then we also have these other tools here, like the screening tool for older people's prescriptions, uh, the screening tool to alert to right treatment. Those are the stop and start, respectively. And then the fit for the aged, or FORTA. And then the Medication Appropriateness Index, MAI. Not to be confused with MAI inhibitors, right? Nothing to do there except, hey, maybe they're on the list, right? Mm -hmm. Then our, our last three tools here, or scales, uh, the ADS, or Anticholinergic Drug Scale, the ACB, or Anticholinergic Cognitive Burden Scale, and then the ARS, the Anticholinergic Risk Scale, well, now that we've read through the titles, uh, obviously these uh, are pertaining to anticholinergic medication concerns. So much so that, uh, you know, eventually here in about a half an hour, when we get towards the end of the beers list update review, there's actually an ent entire section dedicated just to the concept of anticholinergic medications. So within the beers list, there'll be that listing and tool and information. But these three at the bottom here, ADS, ACB, and ARS, them alone, those three, are there to go a little bit further, if need be, when reviewing anticholinergic medication concerns. But in the big picture, you know, by now I'm sure your eyes have gone to the, the wonder, wondering what's going on with this highway picture here. These are all uh, lists and scales and indexes and tools here uh, for taking care of our geriatric patients. They are all a guide. They are all a tool. They are not the law of the land for our planet. Uh, galaxy nor universe uh, there as we already covered you know we're all human we're all different as patients we want in general everybody to kind of you know not you know be within the general bucket and not be statistical outliers uh, but you know it, it, these are a guide okay uh, you can anticipate things it's like I've got here with the picture of uh, there's a sign saying hey you know deer might jump out here it doesn't mean Every time you drive by, a deer is going to jump out, right? Uh, but it means just be, you know, heighten the awareness. That's, uh, you know, perhaps another way of looking at it with these different tools, particularly the AGS beers list update, uh, to, to heighten our awareness from the point of, uh, you know, 65 and older for providing patient care. But we want to dive, of course, into the uh, most recent update, the 2023 American Geriatric Society, or AGS, Beers List Update, or Beers Criteria Update. Uh, that, that's uh, the Dr. Mark. Some might say the other. Whatever. Uh, but, you know, that's uh, originally uh, coming uh, from Dr. Mark Beers as the, the head of the team, of course, and usually gets updated about every three years. This last one was about three and a half to four years. But, you know, there was a lot going on in the world in the last three to four years. eh? Uh, but anyways, the, the most recent update is, of course, from 2023. Uh, so I have that here for us so that we could uh, just see, you know, where we're going with this conversation. Okay, so the beers list, the AGS beers criteria beers list has been around for over three decades now, okay? And before that, we've certainly had different guides, like we, you know, cover the different scales and indexes and tools for helping our geriatric patients, of course. Uh, but the beers list specifically has been around for over 30 years now. Uh, there's been updates along the way, and that's what I just briefly wanted to cover here. So, you know, the original guideline came out in 1991. Uh, with uh, Dr. Mark Beers, you know, spearheading the effort, uh, and then six years later there was the first update uh, that was really to clarify the medications to avoid, uh, doses or frequencies to avoid, 
uh, and medications to avoid in patients with specific conditions, which as we'll see here in a moment, that uh, idea has continued to today's uh, beers list update as well too. Uh, then uh, another six years later, uh, in 2003, there was an update, uh, the idea of uh, you know avoiding because of ineffectiveness or high risk uh, with safer alternatives being available. So, you know, using the best out of the bunch. Uh, and then also the further clarify the medications to avoid in specific medical conditions. Then took a while, but nine years later in 2012, uh, the basically the updated review criteria basis was uh, changed. That, you know, with the quality and strength of evidence, what will eventually be Table One, just going over the specifics for how uh, the beers list uh, is updated. Then we got more on the you know the scheduling of every three or four years. So three years later in 2015. There were a pretty big part here. Uh, there was new categories of recommendations, including renal adjustments and drug drug interactions, which we still see in the guideline today. Then four years later in 2019, uh, they had uh, 13 experts reviewing about 1,400 articles. That's a lot of reading uh, from the previous years, you know, looking for updated clinical information. And we see that again, uh, you know, four years later for the 2023 update with a dozen experts reviewing couple more articles, 1,600 of them, uh, from the years since the prior update uh, with updated clinical information because we always have more information, thus the recommendations and guidelines need to update along the way as well. So that's going to bring us, of course, to current day for the current AGS Spears list update. So for the current update, uh, we see the trends, uh, you know, the, the amount of tables, the way that the AGS beers list uh, is organized. The different sections are grouped by tables, rather large tables more often than not, by the way. Uh, and we'll be covering them here, of course. But uh, the overall idea is, you know, starting out with table one, uh, as I alluded to earlier, it's really just going over the evidence and the strength of the recommendations. Really important stuff, of course, going over quality and strength. Uh, but it's not the actual clinical information, but it's, you know, how to read through the clinical information in subsequent tables. So table two is really the first table with the clinical patient care information. It's a big one. It is many pages, actually. Uh, and it is titled the Potentially Inappropriate Medication Use in Older Adults, or abbreviated as PIMS. By the end of this presentation and conversation, you're going to be hearing PIMS a lot. You might even repeat it yourself at dinner tonight or tomorrow, right? So that's table two, and it's a big one. We'll get to that in a hot second. Uh, table three continues the idea of PIMS, but it's PIMS that are due to drug disease or drug syndrome interactions that may exacerbate the disease or syndrome. Remember, we mentioned uh, about probably about two decades ago, that was one of the updates to the beers list of going into, uh, you know, PIMS applicable for those with specific diseases or conditions. Table four uh, is PIMS by drugs to be used with caution. So not necessarily to avoid, but just, you know, put up a couple extra flags there and pump the brakes, use some caution. Table five, incredibly important, even within our learning objectives, uh, it's the potentially inappropriate drug-drug interactions that should be avoided. It's a relatively concise list. We'll go there in a moment, uh, but that's, you know, a big idea there too. Now, table six is medications that should be avoided or have dosage reduced with varying levels of kidney function in older adults. So it's all about the renal changes like we talked about earlier as we all age. Uh, table seven, alluded to this earlier as well, it's the drugs with strong anticholinergic properties. Now remember, there's the three uh, scales overall in addition to the beers list, but here in the beers list, they're just you know putting those right out there. And finally, tables 8, 9, and 10 are basically collectively talking about the changes since the last beers list update. Um, and that would be, you know, those removed, added, and modified as far as any um, recommendations along the way. These tables in totality are what make up the AGS beers list. So the first table that we're going to review here today uh, is table 2. It is the largest, the most impactful table. It is the potentially inappropriate medication use in older adults, or the PIMS. Now, we're going to have over a dozen uh, tables or slides illustrating table two of PIMS within the AGS Beers list update. Uh, this is the first of many, of course, but this is breaking down the tables into uh, slides and conversation for us here. 
Now, when we go through each of these slides, I'm not going to read everything, of course. There's a lot here for reference. Uh, and a lot of times I, I, I took the liberty to help out here by, you know, listing medications within each class of what's available uh, and then providing the rationale for why these medications are on uh, the potentially inappropriate medications for use in the elderly or PIMS list. And then, you know, we'd be remiss to not at least mention or provide some possible alternatives. It's one thing to say that a medication should be uh, avoided, but then what? So each of the charts that I'm going to provide, you're going to have some, uh, when possible, some alternatives. It's not going to work for every patient, just like the recommendations won't, of course, but at least it's somewhere to start, right? So in the first part of table two here in this slide, we have the first generation antihistamines. Of course, we've got a lot of anticholinergic activity. Dry it up, slow it down. Uh, it can lead to, uh, you know, even confusion and the proverbial fall, break hip go to hospital, get infection, and then all of a sudden there's a funeral. We want to avoid that at all costs, okay? Uh, that, that's actually uh, uh, why we, we installed uh, steps all the way around our house, because I, I fear that happening, even for yours truly and anyone else, uh, of, you know, just uh, slipping on the grass. Well, we're going to eliminate that, right? If we're going to do that, we want to uh, watch out with the PIMS as well. So in addition to the first gen antihistamines, we've got uh, two specific anti-Parkinson's agents and a handful here of antispasmodics. And again, it's all about that anticholinergic side for the most part and a couple alternatives here for us. Now, continuing the table two, uh, we have uh, dipyramidal, uh, by the way, that's for oral short acting. Uh, the combination with aspirin, the ER, uh, that's one of the actual alternatives, so it's not talking about that one. Uh, and then also as far as any antibiotics, we have nitrofurantoin. Uh, and then in the uh, genitourinary sense, there's desmopressin. Uh, again, providing lots of uh, reference and takeaways here for folks in these charts as far as alternatives as well. All right, within table two, we're going to jump into the island of cardiovascular. There's going to be three slides, parts one, two, and three, for just for cardiovascular within table two within the AGS update, right? Uh, so aspirin for primary prevention. No longer recommended here, okay? Not really even talking about alternatives because it's just saying, hey, that, that's that's a no-go as far as a PIM anyway. Then also our peripheral alpha-1 blockers for hypertension. Uh, a pretty good listing of alternatives as well, though. But then also central alpha agonists uh, for, as far as first line for hypertension. Uh, there we're talking clonidine and guanfacine. More so we see clonidine in, in typical use, of course. And then amiodarone. Uh, you know, if there's ever a medication to talk about side effects and concerns, hey, that's one of the poster kiddos, right? Uh, but these are our first of the cardiovascular agents. And here's our second of three for cardiovascular. We have uh, drondarone, uh, digoxin, more than 125 micrograms. So basically it's, uh, you know, we got some alternatives there, but one of the alternatives is just limiting DIG to 125 micrograms. Uh, also on the listing is immediate release nifedipine keeping that in mind with some alternatives and rationale as well. All right, to wrap up the cardio side, part three of three here, uh, we have Rivaroxban uh, and then also Warfarin, specifically for non-valvular AFib uh, and VTE. Now, uh, as far as alternatives, it's really that uh, decision between Warfarin and DOAX, uh, and then uh, you know factors including creatinine clearance uh, and continued use along the way as well. Lots of rationale here provided for further reflection. All right, now we're going to jump into the CNS island of the Table 2 PIMS. First up, we have antidepressants, uh, those being strong anticholinergics, of course. Uh, basically, when it comes to tricyclic antidepressants or TCAs, it's all of them, except doxepin, less than or equal to 6 milligrams a day. Uh, and as far as the one that's concerning amongst SSRIs, it's paroxetine. And also remember that has a relatively um, longer half-life compared to others as well, too. Now, luckily, we do have alternatives, but I will caution folks to keep in mind that as we go through this uh, beers list, to update, uh, some of these things actually pop up in other areas based on other conditions or drug interactions. Next up, we have the first and second generation antipsychotics. That's a lot of medications, okay? I didn't even list them all there because, boy, pretty hard to fit them all, right? Uh, alternatives being uh, behavioral interventions. And then we have DHE, uh, and these days, of course, when it comes to the migraine side of the realm, uh, we have our uh, CGRP agents, uh, both for, for treatment and prevention along the way. 
All right, CNS part two. We have barbiturates. Um, then we also have meprobamate. And then benzodiazepines. A little bit more to come on that, but all of them. Okay. Back in the day, in previous uh, releases of this uh, guideline, uh, it went into the longer acting as being the concern, and perhaps the intermediate actings. Uh, but now it's being it's uh, said to be all benzos. Okay. And then also all the Z-hypnotics, all three of the heavy hitters, of course. Uh, as far as alternatives, again, just like I mentioned in the previous slide, we have them. I got them listed here, of course. Uh, you know, not an all-inclusive list, but uh, got to watch out for other factors for patients as well, too. Now, with all benzos being on the AGS beers list now, uh, we want to you know, remember that it, it really doesn't necessarily matter as far as long-acting, intermediate-acting, or short-acting as I'm providing this uh, adaptive reference here for you. Uh, you, you know, the, the idea is longer-acting was typically those that were frowned upon in the beers list. A, alprazolam 0.25 milligrams. B, digoxin 125 micrograms. C, nortriptyline 25 milligrams, or D, paroxetine 20 milligrams. And of course, as we had recently reviewed, the answer is digoxin 125 micrograms because it's anything above that dosage that would be on the list of PIMS. All right, folks, we're still in table two of the uh, beers list update, right? Uh, here we have uh, endocrine, part one of three. So another island here within table two is endocrine. Uh, first up, we have androgens um, and then also desiccated thyroid. Now, when we're talking about an alternative for desiccated thyroid, of course, we have levothyroxine. I've also provided, uh, you know, the documented here and referenced uh, conversion chart, the conversion factors for going from that desiccated thyroid to levothyroxine, just so that we get that right when going from grains to micrograms, respectively. All right, next up in the endocrine island within table two, uh, we have estrogens with or without progestins course we've got alternatives here as listed uh, and then magestrol and also growth hormone that of note not really having any alternatives it's just a general idea of you know recommending to avoid overall now by now you're thinking man I'm really gonna have to go through these slides again you don't have to it's we're really looking at the big pictures here but I do recommend having them on hand because yeah we did put a lot of time into uh, you know providing the rationale and, and alternatives along the way to go a, a little bit uh, you know steps further than the even the guideline itself but part three of the endocrine island within table two is sliding scale insulin that's actually been there for a while within the AGS beers list uh, and then also uh, sulfonylureas but now it's all of them so, you know, in the past, you used to be thinking, uh, you know, like glyburide compared to glipizide, preferring glipizide, but now it's just saying all the sulfas. Kind of like the idea of all benzos. All right, now we're onward to the GI island within table two. Uh, so now we have PPIs, okay? All of them. All right, so alternatives, well, we would be looking at our H2, uh, H2RAs, of course, and also antacids. Uh, you know, for those that are available. Uh, but also uh, within table two is uh, metoclopramide. Got a, a couple specific alternatives here for us. And then uh, oral mineral oil, that's been around on this list for a while as well. All right, now we're heading into pain guys territory, right? We're gonna have uh, two different slides for pain management, maybe even a bonus one, uh, as far as table two within the AGS beers list. So first up is the specific prescription opioid of meparidine. Uh, and then also we have the spasmodic muscle relaxants. Uh, so there we'd be thinking pretty much all of the muscle relaxants, quote unquote, other than baclofen and tizanidine, because those are actually there for spasticity overall. All right. Next up on the pain management island here, we have the non-cox selective NSAIDs. Got a laundry list here for us, but in essence, folks, it's pretty much all of them except celecoxib. 
Okay, we can wrap that one up in that statement. Uh, but then also, um, because of different rationales, endomethacin and ketorolac are kind of on their own island within table two. But the overall idea is really, if utilizing an NSAID, then looking to celecoxib uh, in its various formulations. You know, we have, uh, of course, the capsules along the way, but then also liquid. And then we have non-NSAID options as well, of course. Interestingly enough, when talking about the NSAIDs being on the AAGS beers list uh, update here, um, there's conflicting data out there as far as, you know, COX-1 to COX-2 selectivity and vice versa. So here's two different references just talking about how, you know, different ways of looking at things. So we really have to watch our references and what we're utilizing out there as far as COX selectivity. So I wanted to provide these for everybody here just for further reflection, of course. Uh, but the bottom line for the overall AGS beers list update is that it, it's, you know, all of the NSAIDs except celecoxib are identified as PIMS. All right, time for our second assessment question. The 2023 AGS beers list recommends to avoid which of the following potentially inappropriate medications for utilization with elderly patients in all scenarios. A, baclofen 10 milligrams. B, celecoxib 200 milligrams, C, omeprazole 20 milligrams, or D, tizanidine 4 milligrams. Now, this one might have been a little trickier for us here, but the answer, of course, is C, omeprazole 20 milligrams. Uh, the overall idea there is that uh, it's a PPI, and the PPIs were on the PIM list within Table 2. Uh, baclofen and tizanidine were the antispasticity muscle relaxants that were available as alternatives to uh, the spasmodic muscle relaxants. And, of course, as we bang the drum loudly, celecoxib was the preferred NSAID. All right, folks, all of that was just table two. I promise that the following tables have much less bandwidth and depth to them. Uh, but here we're going to review, uh, next up is table three, the PIMS due to drug disease or drug syndrome interactions uh, that may exacerbate that disease or syndrome. So essentially what we're looking at is table two was for everybody. Table three is going to be if a patient has the specific condition. So first up for table three here, we have uh, heart failure, and we have agents to avoid, uh, and then avoid if there's a specific heart failure uh, with a reduce, reduced ejection fraction or half ref. Uh, and then there's also even things to use in caution with asymptomatic heart failure, uh, but to avoid in symptomatic heart failure. So I've got those broken down with uh, three separate uh, rows here within the overall idea of heart failure. Then if there's syncope, uh, there's uh, the medications that are, uh, you know, of concern here, anticholinergics, of course, for bradycardia, uh, and then, you know, non-selective peripheral alpha-1 blockers, tertiary tricyclic antidepressants, and then antipsychotics. Got a couple listed here of each, with all of those having concerns of orthostatic hypotension. Next within table three, if a patient has delirium, here is a laundry list of medications to avoid. Uh, if a patient has dementia and cognitive impairment, this the second uh, row here, we have a, a slightly smaller list of medications that are recommended to avoid. And then if a, a patient has a history of falls or fractures, we got another long list here as well too. The overall idea here is, you know, affecting the psychology of someone, the, the sedation or the cognition to ultimately avoid falls and fractures. Now, along those same lines, if a patient has Parkinson's, uh, there's the antipsychotics and antiemetics that are recommended to be avoided to, to avoid worsening the Parkinson's symptoms. If a patient has a history of a gastric or a duodenal ulcer, ulcer want to avoid aspirin uh, and, uh, of course, those non-selective NSAIDs, which are already on table two anyway. Uh, and then if someone has a chronic kidney disease, stages four or five, you want to avoid all NSAIDs, so we're not selecting even one of them out. Uh, for uh, females, urinary incontinence, one will be avoiding uh, oral or transdermal estrogen. 
Uh, and then also peripheral alpha-1 blockers, not, not observed to be utilized a lot, though, in that uh, realm. Uh, and then uh, with BPH, you want to avoid anticholinergics. But I bet you knew that one, right? All right, as promised, that was Table 3, quite shorter than Table 2, right? Let's jump into Table 4 now, the potentially inappropriate medications, uh, drugs to be used with caution in older adults. All right, I've got Table 4 down to one slide, okay? Uh, these, again, medications to be used with caution in older adults. Not saying to, to avoid them, just with caution. We've got them listed here, and we've got some rationale. Didn't provide alternatives here because some we've, um, you know, discussed as far as other types of genre of care for alternatives. Uh, but big picture here, these are things just to use with caution, which caution is also associated with a lot of monitoring along the way as well. All right, here's a big one, folks. Table 5 is potentially inappropriate drug-drug interactions that should be avoided in older adults. So important that we even made it our uh, third learning objective, I believe. All right, I am going to go through these because they're rather important. But uh, basically, drug-drug interactions to avoid in the elderly, first up is multiple anticholinergic medications. Of course, individually, they're probably going to be within Table 2 for the PIMS anyway, but certainly multiple of them would be a concern as well. Right along the same lines, opioids and benzos or opioids and gabapentinoids. Uh, and then in general, going a step further, uh, greater than or equal to three CNS active medications. The same concerns there for you know sedation, uh, but then also falls and fractures specifically. Then we jump uh, over on the cardio side, generally, uh, but multiple RAS inhibitors or a RAS inhibitor with a potassium sparring diuretic, because you gotta worry about hyperkalemia, you gotta monitor potassium no matter what, right? Uh, then also, uh, jumping into the very specific drug-drug uh, interaction concerns, uh, ACEs, ARBs, and loops with lithium, because that would uh, contribute to lithium toxicity. Warfarin in general, and we remember that from Table 3 as well, uh, but just the bleeding risk. Got a couple uh, uh, drug interactions of concern with warfarin listed here. Uh, but then also peripheral alpha-1 blockers with loops. Uh, and then also theophylline and cimetidine or cipro. And then phenytoin uh, with uh, trimethoprin, sulfamethoxazole, antibiotic, of course. Uh, so those last uh, handful there were the specific ones. Uh, the first three or four groups or rows here were groups or classes of medicines. All right, next up we have table six, and that's uh, a listing here. I'll have it over two slides for medications that should be avoided or, or their dose is used, uh, based on kidney function in older adults. All right, first up are the medications that are recommended to be avoided outright based on kidney function that I have listed here in parentheses. So, you know, you got to look at creatinine clearance and then base the recommendation to avoid uh, for these specific medications or classes uh, based on that creatinine clearance. And conversely, even with a different color to distinguish from the previous slide, uh, we have here uh, based on creatinine clearance. Uh, the medications that ha are recommended to have a reduction in dosage based on that creatinine clearance. All right, so hopefully those were two good reference slides for you going forward, of course. Uh, no one's here to memorize everything, right? But we want to have a good reference overall. Nothing beats the actual AGS beers list, but here, you know, here we're providing these as summary for, you know, making it a little bit easier to use these in patient care. Next up, though, with Table 7 is drugs with strong anticholinergic properties. Now, ironically enough, we've actually talked about a good number of these, if not all of them, in previous tables and table and slides here, of course, in our presentation. Uh, I would recall, uh, you know, uh, certainly have everybody recall that there's the different anticholinergic medication scales, you know, besides the American Geriatric Society or AGS beers list. Um, so keeping that in mind in the really big picture, but here's the laundry listing of, a, you know, strong anticholinergic activity medications. Uh, broken down into the different classes of medications here. But again, most of these we've actually talked about already in the individual tables, like the potentially inappropriate medications or PIMS. Uh, but here it's just outright seeing them in the anticholinergic sense. All right, and as we wrap up the tables, not our conversation, but the tables within the AGS beers list update, uh, tables 8, 9, and 10 are basically the updates since the last uh, release. And the way we look at the updates are, involves table eight being the removals, table nine being the additions, 
and table 10 being the only other option, the modifications. So, you know, in the big picture here, uh, there was, uh, I think, you know, as we've already discussed, now it's all benzos on the PIM list, uh, all sulfas in the uh, diabetes sense, um, you know, on, on the list. Uh, warfarin comes up as far as the additions for the drug-drug interactions and the concerns overall, uh, depending on the disease state. Uh, heart failure had a lot more information because there's been a lot more uh, clinical studies out there in the realm of heart failure, of course. Uh, some of the um, you know drug interactions that we talked about on that uh, one slide to put it all together in one slide for you, uh, that's some additions as well too. And then there was just here and there some shifts from one table to another. But it, you know the important part is the information as a totality as we went over here today, of course. So that's all the tables, um, all 10 tables. We didn't spend any time on table one because it was just reviewing important stuff about quality of evidence and the strength of recommendations, but not the actual clinical information. But that is everything, and hopefully these slides will be a good reference for everyone going forward, particularly with the rationales and the alternatives. But it doesn't end there, of course. Because, you know, then at that point, it's kind of like, good golly, there's a lot of medications on the beers list. And then we have alternatives, but, well, the alternatives are going to come with baggage, too. So what are we to do? Well, it brings up the big picture, perhaps philosophical idea of, well, if not anything, then something. Uh, and then, of course, the idea that the beers list is always a guideline. It, it, no guideline is going to work in every single scenario. But, you know, we don't want to be statistical outliers in every scenario either, right? You got to go in patient-by-patient -patient scenarios using clinical judgment, no matter what monitoring because you know even alternatives come with baggage and of course documenting along the way and in the much bigger picture we always got to remember the biopsychosocial model of uh, healthcare and patient care overall you know and as healthcare professionals we really tend to concentrate on uh, the biological sense particularly within the pharmacy realm of course but there's also the psychological uh, side of things still within healthcare and then everything outside of healthcare like the social and environmental impacts so the biopsychosocial model of healthcare really pulls it all together for us and we'd probably be remiss not to mention uh, you know something that <laughs> could have its uh, week long training in itself if not lifelong by the way but mi and uh, yeah not a heart attack but motivational interviewing uh, there's a couple key components of motivational interviewing I encourage everybody to certainly dive deeper uh, could help with everything uh, with patient care, but also eh, in regular life too. Uh, but there's always a spirit of partnership and collaboration with open-ended questions, a uh, spirit of acceptance with affirmations, a spirit of compassion with reflections, truly listening and reflecting to what our patients are saying, and then ending, mm, if there's ever an end, but uh, the finale, at least, of uh, evocation, having those summarizing statements for each part of a conversation. In the big picture, having shared decision-making. All right, so we're going to go over, and eh, we'll do about three patient cases, kind of wrapping this all together here. But uh, by the way, no patient is ever just a medication list, particularly when considering the biopsychosocial model of healthcare, right? But in the pharmacy realm, let's, in these cases, we're just looking at the medication list, but there is so much more. Now here, I'm sure your eyes have wandered through the warfarin, the HCTZ, the atorvastatin, omeprazole, diazepam, cyclobenzaprine, tramadol, and naproxen. In the respect of the 2023 AGS beers list update, what would be any recommendations just on the medication list here for you? Take a moment to ponder. All right, we're not going to ponder too, too long, though. Uh, with the warfarin, uh, you know, chronic utilization typically okay to maintain here. Uh, omeprazole, I want to reevaluate the diagnosis and the need because PPIs are on the PIMS, right? Uh, that day is a PIM. First up, inquire as to the frequency of utilization and if there's any leftover supply. And then the reality, of course, of it being a PIM. Uh, same thing with cyclobenzaprine. Um, you know, reevaluate the diagnosis and the need because it's on table two of the PIMS. Uh, and then uh, as far as tramadol goes, consider any alternatives along the way. And then naproxen, consider silicoxib. Uh, of note, though, there are diazepam, cyclobenzaprine, and tramadol. That's the three CNS medications that's propelling some of these previous recommendations because of that drug, drug, drug interaction concern. All right, let's do another one with slightly less medications, right? So here, elderly patient has this medication list. Lilsartan, rosuvastatin, paroxetine, naproxen, and zolpidem. 
What are your thoughts and recommendations? All right, I have a feeling that you might have uh, come up with some of these here, of course. Well, paroxetine, we want to consider alternatives. Uh, that was the SSRI that has that longer duration of action and anticholinergic uh, effects there in the table two of PIMS. Of course, naproxen, consider silicoxib. And zolpidem, uh, reevaluate that diagnosis as a need uh, because it is going to, you know, obviously, to, <laughs> remains to be said, sedation, of course, uh, but any, uh, you know, confusion leading to a fall risk overall. All right, one more, folks. Uh, this one's a little shorter medication list, but an uh, elderly patient has the following medication list. Duloxetine 50, Yavapetin 800 milligrams, TID, Losartan 25 milligrams, once a day. Uh, are there any medications requiring adjustment or avoidance based on a creatinine clearance of 20? All right, well, unless you are a very rapid learner, you'd want to go back to those two slides where we had the avoidance and the reduced uh, dosages based on creatinine clearance. There you would come up with the answers, of course, uh, with that duloxetine you'd want to avoid, gabapentin you'd want to reduce the dose, and that's that for a patient with a creatinine clearance of 20. All right, well, that was a lot, right? I mean, that was three pretty straightforward cases, but boy, they had a lot going on, right? Our work is never done as pharmacists, of course. And here is even more homework for all of us, present self included. Uh, geriatric paperwork. Well, it's actually universal for everybody. Uh, here's a distinguishment between living wills, power of attorney, durable power of attorney, and durable power of attorney for healthcare decisions. And then, of course, do not resuscitate or DNR orders. These are all types of paperwork, albeit electronic usually, that you want to have on file. And some uh, health systems even require them to be on file specifically with them, uh, you know, within an electronic healthcare record or EHR along the way. But this is for everybody, folks, but certainly applicable to have with, in conversations with our geriatric patients. All right, by now you're probably thinking, well, boy, maybe I got to get my ducks around with that paperwork. Well, uh, then also for, for your own homework, uh, here's some additional resources when it comes to geriatric care. We've got apps, textbooks, journals, things online, uh, whenever available here, of course. But of course, to look further than just the AGS beers list. All right, that pretty much wraps up our discussion here with Q&A to come, of course, but our key takeaways from this 2023 AGS beers list update conversation include uh, hepatic and renal function decline with age requiring the avoidance of re or reduced dosage of many medications. Potentially inappropriate medications or PIMS for older adults include first generation antihistamines, first and second generation antipsychotics, TCAs, all of them except doxepin if it's uh, gr uh, less than or equal to six milligrams, paroxetine, all benzos, barbiturates, Z-hypnotics, Opioids, NSAIDs, except celecoxib, of course, spasmodic muscle relaxants, nitrofurantoin, peripheral alpha-1 blockers for hypertension, central alpha agonists, digoxin with a dose greater than 125 micrograms, and sliding scale insulin utilization, amongst others. Drug-drug interactions to avoid in older adults include having multiple anticholinergics, However, though, remember, even uh, on the individual level, they're in different other uh, components of the AGS Spears list of uh, PIMS, uh, but then also opioids with benzos or gabapentin weights, and generally speaking, uh, greater than or equal to three CNS medications, uh, multiple RAS inhibitors, a RAS inhibitor with potassium sparring diuretic, uh, ACEs, ARBs, and loops with lithium, and peripheral alpha-1 blockers and loops and warfarin with either amiodarone, ciprofloxacin, macrolides, except azithromycin, uh, TMP, SMZ, or SSRIs. And finally, highly anticholinergic medications include first-generation antihistamines, TCAs, uh, with a general clinical consideration of uh, not worrying about doxepin less than or equal to 6 milligrams, but then also paroxetine, uh, antimuscarinics utilized in urinary incontinence, certain antispasmodics, certain antipsychotics, benztropine and uh, trihexylphenidyl, cyclobenzaprine, and orphenadrine, amongst others. And last but not least, we wanted to provide the listing here of the references that we've utilized for this presentation and webinar, uh, particularly, of course, the 2023 AGS, or American Geriatric Society, uh, beers list update. I really want to thank everyone for their time here today.
And of course, one of the one of the important things on the side uh, is the evaluation access code, which we have as three four zero zero zero. Thank you all for participating in today's live webinar. If you haven't already, please go ahead and enter your questions or comments into the chat box now, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible in the remaining time available. At this time, you'll find the link to the core survey in the chat window. As a reminder, you will need to complete this survey to have your participation reported to CPE Monitor and to CE Broker. Please make sure to take note of the four digit code displayed on the screen now as you will need it to complete the survey. All right, welcome back everyone. Not that you went anywhere, right? Um, well, just as a reminder, of course, um, you know, we do have the slides available. I think folks were actually asking in the chat for that. So uh, there were links provided there uh, as far as the, the link uh, for survey and then also for slides along the way as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Good golly. Uh, and the code again um, here uh, is 7829. Uh, so that's that's the actual evaluation code that you want to go with, 7829. Uh, we misspoke earlier there, basically. But all right, so keep any questions and comments coming in, uh, whether it's in the Q&A actual portion here for the Zoom um, or even just in the chat. Don't worry, I can handle it all there So um, for both sides. But uh, just disregard that 34,000 um, uh, as far as the code earlier. The code is 7829. All right, uh, two other things I just want to mention because we've got very limited time here as far as getting to any questions and thoughts from everybody. Two ways of keeping in touch. Uh, by all means, if we're not connected on LinkedIn, head on over to LinkedIn and link. Uh, feel free to message as well if you'd like to, uh, or if you have any burning questions or anything like that. Uh, if you don't have LinkedIn by now, probably not get one. So you could also mosey on over to uh, my trademark, Pain Guy. Uh, you could go to painguy.us for good old United States. Uh, it's not .com, but painguy.us. Uh, you could actually message me directly. It'll literally come right to my phone. Um, and then also uh, there's resources and uh, references and headlines. Uh, resources kind of like this uh, Beers Criteria Guideline update uh, from earlier this year. Hard to believe we're already going to be in 2024 in a few short weeks, right? Practically days at this point. Um, also, if anybody's going to ASHP mid-year, see you there. Be flying out to LA, Anaheim, uh, the end of this week. So make sure to uh, touch base. I have uh, two presentations there, actually. All right. So jumping into people's thoughts and questions here. I uh, had a, a question or two or thoughts coming in here as far as gabapentin. Uh, so these uh, beers criteria, the AGS beers criteria guideline, uh, it gets updated typically every three to four years. And there's changes here and there. When it comes to gabapentin, that's typically lumped in uh, with other medications that have sedative properties. You know, certainly gabapentin working within... Uh, the the presynaptic area within the ballpark, you know, the presynaptic, postsynaptic, the synaptic left uh, of other characters and ball players within that ballpark, like benzos, other seizure meds, alcohol, barbiturates, the list goes on. Uh, we usually get the question like here, um, you know, why why is that not a controlled substance? Your guess is as good as mine, uh, but it is a controlled substance in seven different states. I can't rattle them all off. I know that my own wild and wonderful West Virginia is one of them. And one of our neighbors, uh, Kentucky is as well too. Uh, the other ones, hey, if you're one of them, chime in here, folks. We'll all learn from each other. Uh, and Michael, you're very welcome. Uh, as far as the presentation goes and the topic, hey, we're all uh, either geriatric or want to be someday, right? So even in a me, me, me society, it's all about us, right? And along the way, perhaps we help some elderly patients as well. I get this all the time too, um, uh, the idea of, uh, well, what defines elderly? I know we went over it earlier, but after this conversation, we might as well hit it up again here. Um, at 65 years of age and older. Is it arbitrary? Is it concrete, subjective, objected? Eh, it's got a flavor of it all, right? 
Um, a lot of things are based on the anatomy and physiology changes, particularly kidneys, quite frankly. Uh, we lose a GFR every year from the age of 50 onward on average. So, uh, and this uh, guideline, Beer's criteria, does not address everything uh, by all means. It's not one of those like, oh, well, if it's not on this list, then free for all for utilization. Uh, there's other medications, uh, biologics come to mind. Uh, hey, uh, folks are usually, meant, nobody mentioned it here tonight, but usually, folks are usually mentioned, uh, what about statins? You get any muscle soreness, side effect, or you know, even the bigger picture? Um, yeah, those things are, are things to keep in mind as well, too. Any guideline is not the end all, regardless of who's saying it and who's it coming from, right? Uh, all remember, we had the slide with uh, every all medicines have their baggage, and uh, it's like going through the airport. You know, you go through everything and lose every wine bottle opener you have, and then all of a sudden, when it comes time to pick up your luggage, eh, it's a free for all. You'll be sitting there for seven days before you get it sometimes. All right. Um, Cynthia mentioned that Michigan is also one of those states for gabapentin as a controlled substance. So we got three out of seven here, right? Speaking of seven, again, the code is 7829. So just keeping that in mind here as well, uh, too, folks. All right. Um, looks like we're actually out of time. I certainly want to respect everyone's time. No way we can get to everything, of course. But like I said, feel free to keep in touch on LinkedIn directly and also pangai.us. Otherwise, folks, hope you already had a good holiday last week. And I hope you have a good rest of the week this week. But no matter what, I wish you a great day every day.